As the 19th century drew to a close, in the Laurentian Mountains north of Montreal, a priest of great stature was seized with railway fever. The only cure for Father LaBelle was a train, the Petit Train du Nord. Beginning around 12 kilometers north of Montreal is a chain of mountains known as the Laurentians, towering above a dense forest of maple and spruce trees. The Rouge, Nord, and Lièvre rivers traverse this wild region, once known as the Pays d'En Haut. In this rugged yet pastoral environment, a country priest whose faith could move mountains undertook a long crusade. He wanted to build a railway that would link the chain of villages in the Laurentians to the big city of Montreal. That was the dream of Father LaBelle. For more than a century, trains traveled along this small railway known as the Petit Train du Nord through all kinds of weather over mountain and valley. The history of the Laurentians remains profoundly linked to that of the Petit Train du Nord. At the heart of this region, now a playground for tourists, the presence of Father LaBelle and his crazy project are still palpable. With his dreams of a railway and fertile farmlands, he left an indelible mark. Antoine LaBelle's name is everywhere. On a train station, a street, a bicycle path. A proponent of colonization, he built a kingdom and himself became king of the north. Father LaBelle's village was St. Jerome, the gateway to the Laurentians. It was there that a large part of the adventure of the rural train would be written and the legend of Father LaBelle would take shape. In the park next to the church, a solid bronze king of the north stands watching over his parishioners. In a typical gesture, he extends his powerful arm to the north, seeming to show us the way even today. It was in 1833 that Father LaBelle was born in the village of St. Rose near the Mill Ill River. As in many of the Quebec villages of yesteryear, life revolved around the church. Antoine LaBelle grew up within hearing distance of the church bells under the wing of Father Brunet. Inside the walls of the austere presbytery, Father Brunet took care of Antoine's Christian education. At the age of 11, Antoine entered a seminary located in the next village, St. Therese. He came out eight years later clothed in the cassock, breviary in hand. He took his vows at the age of 22, whereas canon law requires that priests be at least 24. It would be the first of a long list of precedents for Father LaBelle. At one point after the conquest, the Catholic Church came close to disappearing. There were priests who returned to France, and for a long time there was no bishop here. So no new ones could be ordained. There ended up being a shortage of priests, and some had huge parishes to cover. That's the source of the rebellious spirit of the parishioners, who rarely saw their priest. 
At the beginning of the 1840s, the clergy in Quebec, or actually Lower Canada, had very few members. Is that why Father Labelle was ordained sooner? Two years sooner, in fact. It's possible. Or it might have been his talent. It was already obvious that the man was meant for that. In 1860, Antoine Labelle obtained his first parish, St. Antoine Abbey. The village was a battleground. Catholics and Protestants were at each other's throats. But with his quarterback's physique and sharp wits, Father Labelle quickly quelled the passions of his hot-headed parishioners. By the standards of the time, Father Labelle was a colossal man. He was probably six feet tall, and when they said someone was a six-footer, that really meant something. And he was a man who quickly came to appreciate good food. He would eat his meals with Father Vinay, his first priest, when he was still a curate. He also enjoyed a glass of cognac, he liked to smoke, and he liked good food. Apparently, he soon weighed 300 pounds or more, so in the eyes of the people of that time, he was a giant, a colossus. A larger-than-life figure, Father Lavelle served as inspiration to writer Claude-Henri Grignot, who made him a hero of the popular Quebec television series, Les Belles Histoires des Pays d'en haut. In the mid-19th century, just as Antoine Lebel was starting his life as a priest, rural Quebec was facing a crisis. The population in the country was visibly shrinking. Every day, whole families crossed the border to start over in New England, where a meager salary awaited them in the cotton mills. During this period, half a million French Canadians left Quebec. Father Lobel took on a new mission, to halt the exodus of his people and work to improve living conditions in Quebec. It seemed that the nation was dwindling, not only in terms of numbers, but also we as French Canadians. If we go to the United States, we will be lost in American materialism, we will give up our religion, etc. So it was essential to prevent this exodus, a tragedy in their eyes. And that led to the idea of colonization. It was in that sense that Labelle was a kind of nationalist. In 1861, Antoine's father died. His mother, Angelique, was left alone. She moved to the presbytery and remained there for the rest of her life, taking on the position of presbytery intendant. Before attaining the prestigious post of priest of Saint Jerome, Antoine Labelle paid his dues in a village that was even more difficult than the preceding one. For years, St. Bernard de la Colle had been immersed in a parochial war. The cause? A long-standing quarrel about the Catholic Church located three kilometers outside the village. The villagers thought it was too far away, so hardly anyone went to Sunday Mass. This gave the Protestants a golden opportunity to open wide the doors of their church located right in the heart of town. To make his lost sheep see reason, Father Labelle did not hesitate to make use of the threat represented by the Irish Catholic patriots exiled in the United States, those barbarians known as the Fenians. The Fenians were Irish patriots gathered together in a fraternity that I think was more or less secret. Wanting to avenge themselves for the treatment England had imposed upon Ireland back in Europe, for that was their country of origin, they had emigrated to the United States. Wanting to make England pay the price for this treatment, they decided to get back at its colony, British North America, which was the Canadian colony. They did so by attacking the colony, using weapons, of course. There were a few raids. 
And in this context, it appears that Labelle formed a sort of rural militia and in this way succeeded in making peace between the Protestants and Catholics in his parish at the same time and demonstrated that they were prepared to defend themselves. Did this have the effect of making the Fenians abandon the idea of attacking by crossing the border at Lacolle, for example? I don't know. Nonetheless, he killed two birds with one stone. He succeeded in bringing peace to his parish by bringing the people together around a shared project, that of preventing the Fenians from attacking their parish. When he left the parish in 1888 to become pastor of St. Jerome, all the townsfolk, English and French, Protestant and Catholic, bade him farewell with a chorus of applause. Antoine Lobel was on his way to becoming a legend. St. Jerome was the center of trade in the Laurentians. In the neighboring townships, however, the colonists were having a hard time. The powerful forestry companies had stumpage, which gave them a virtual monopoly over the territory. The soil was poor and unproductive. As for the roads, they were almost impassable. In this rugged terrain, road conditions were so bad that it took eight days for a letter to get from Mont Laurier to Montreal. Antoine Lobel had his work cut out for him. Further south, in the city of Montreal, political leaders and business people swore by rail as a way to stimulate the economy. Father Lobel was a man of his time and not lacking in ambition. Using his rosary, he beseeched the heavens to grant his prayers and bring the train all the way to his lands. If Providence took too long, he himself would lend a helping hand. In this vast territory, the wild but fertile landscape of the Laurentian Mountains presents itself to visitors like a gift from nature. On his arrival in St. Jerome, Father Labelle too was dazzled by this region that he would soon make his own. Before him, stretching as far as the eye could see, lay his own destiny. Between two sermons, a baptism and a few marriages, he traveled throughout the region. Seeing this vast land still untapped, his colonization project took shape. He imagined villages here and there among the mountains. Already in his mind's eye, he saw churches and heard their bells ringing to announce the birth of a new town. He dreamed of the thousands of Catholic colonists who would settle here in this rugged but promising environment. What would help him is that the Protestant movement was not very strong. At the same time as the colonization of the North was being preached here, a newspaper like the Watchman of La Chute was saying to the English-speaking population, don't waste your time on these fields of stone. Go west instead, to what is now Manitoba, the land of milk and honey. Leave this land to the French Canadians. Take the train and go west. And that's what helped, because in many cases, the English farmers simply abandoned their lands. Except in certain areas, like Arendale, Labelle called it the Garden of the North. There the land was good and the English stayed. But in other areas, they abandoned their lands. So you could say that Labelle won, but at the same time it was by default. Meanwhile, in the cities, the name of a new god was on everyone's lips, the train. In the second half of the 19th century, the train had become the unifying element of the country's elite. The railway bourgeoisie held power and influence. Like many of his contemporaries, Father Labelle believed that the future belonged to rail. He felt it was essential to the development of the northern region so close to his heart. This stand pleased the parishioners who quickly fell in behind their priest, but much more was soon to come. In the secret of the confessional, Father Labelle ordered the faithful to work for the advent of rail as remission for their sins. 
In public, he became a lobbyist and canvassed at a furious pace. The money was in the South, and he made no bones about asking for it. His proposal to Montrealers, a million dollars to finance his project. In return, the city would have access to wood and forest products. Father Lebel put his considerable weight behind convincing businessmen and politicians. He persuaded the rich and powerful Hugh Allen to become involved in his future railway. He received the benediction of several prominent deputies, such as conservative Louis Bobien, whose party colleagues included the influential Georges Etienne Cartier, former lawyer for the Grand Trunk Railway. In the 1870s, there were three projects. The colonization of the north of Montreal, which became the project of the Montreal and Occidental Railway, which had other names, but that's what it was called then. The Laurentians Railway Company and the North Shore Railway. These three railways found themselves in a similar situation, which explained in part the difficulties that all three experienced. First, there was an economic crisis, which hit the Western world around 1873 and affected Quebec too. It delayed things because there was unemployment, government deficits, etc. Secondly, there was the fact that the grants and subsidies given to municipalities were not enough to launch the construction projects. Additional capital was needed. And that's where the Grand Trunk Railway, which already had its own network, apparently intervened in London financial circles to prevent the financing of these other projects because it didn't want any competition. It was in this highly competitive environment that the harsh Quebec winter would lend a hand to Father Lebel's cause. The winter of 1872 was particularly brutal. By mid-January, temperatures were hovering at minus 30 and Montreal was short of wood. Poor families were literally dying of cold. As would happen more than a century later during the 1998 ice storm, wood from the Quebec countryside came to the city's rescue. That was when Father LaBelle arrived on the scene. Wrapped in his fur coat, he came to Montreal heading a procession of 80 sleds loaded with cords of wood. It was a triumph. For years, Montrealers would speak of this act of charity as Father LaBelle's project, or La Corvée du Curé LaBelle. Received with great pomp at the Hotel Jacques Cartier by the city's authorities, he launched into a passionate speech. We need a grand trunk in the north, just like in the south. We are just as intelligent and industrious as the inhabitants of the south. Give us the means of action and we will prove it. This is how we can eventually come to rival the English and the Americans in trade and industry. By 1872, the project was on track. The government seemed interested in the idea of investing in a regional railway. But the following year, a depression struck. Banks collapsed and many small railway companies were driven to the brink of bankruptcy. Father LaBelle's project reached a virtual standstill. No money, no train. But LaBelle was not deterred. He continued to push his project, writing frequent letters to business people, deputies, and ministers. He wrote, it is absolutely necessary that the government acquire a suitable rail line going as far north as possible. That is the province's main artery. That is where all the other roads will end up. The winter of 1876 again caused terrible hardship. Father LaBelle repeated his exploit, this time sending twice as much wood to the south. A convincing orator, he gave many speeches. Finally, the government of Quebec agreed to invest in his project. He had won. The following spring, the Quebec, Montreal, Ottawa, and Occidental Railway built 60 kilometers of track between Montreal and St. Jerome. Father LaBelle followed the construction every step of the way. When the train finally entered the village, everyone celebrated. Father LaBelle was then 43 years old. 
His mission could have ended there, but he dreamed of a railway that went much further than the village limits. He wanted the entire Laurentians to become a domain that extended all the way to Temiskaming in Abitibi. And what would link up this territory? The railway, of course. Ça m'a pris six ans. En 1876, le chemin de fer était rendu à Saint-Jérôme. C'était déjà une grande victoire. Ah, c'est pas suffisant. C'est pas encore assez. Faut aller plus loin, toujours plus haut. À 100 000 d'ici. 125 000 si c'est nécessaire. Ah, je vous souhaite de tout mon cœur, Monseigneur, mais... Là, c'est pas avec des mecs qu'on développe le pays. In 1888, Father Lobel was named Deputy Minister of Agriculture and Colonization. Again, it was a precedent. He was the first high-ranking government official to wear the cassock. The following year, it was Rome's turn to pay tribute to Father Lobel by naming him Bishop. Despite these honors, he remained obsessed with the idea of bringing the train all the way to Mont Laurier. Once again, he implored the heavens to grant his wishes. But time was running out for Father Lobel. His health was failing. Despite his efforts, colonization was a mitigated success. In 50 years, the population had increased by only 20,000 people. If only he could get the Petit Train du Nord to go as far as Mont Laurier, he thought he would die in peace. Back then, there were the ski trains that went to St. Agathe. There were five or six trains that left Montreal in the morning from Windsor Station or Place Vigée Station. They all went to St. Agathe. They had 11 or 12 cars, and they were always full of people. It was not until 1909 that the Petit Train du Nord finally reached Mont Laurier. The line was owned by the prosperous Canadian Pacific Railway. Daily departures headed north from the magnificent Windsor and Jean Talon railway stations in Montreal. Along its route, the train left a trail of parishes and train stations, including one named in honor of the famous priest. The railway brought prosperity to the villages now linked together. With the sawmills, the railway was the backbone of the local economy and contributed to the first real rise of agriculture in the Laurentians. The farmers were still not rich, but at least now they could get by. Between 1900 and 1950, almost everything that came from the south was transported by rail, whether it was for the storekeepers or the animals. But 90% of rail transportation was wood. Father Lebel had achieved his goal. He had created some 60 parishes, all joined by the Petit Train du Nord. But time had played a trick on him. In the winter of 1891, tired and ill, he submitted his resignation as deputy minister to his old friend, Premier Honoré Mercier. On January 8th, he murmured his last words in the ear of an attendant Jesuit. I would prefer to wait till tomorrow before dying. For the first time in his life, he wanted to postpone the inevitable. At 2.30 in the morning, Father Lebel, King of the North, passed away. The dream of Father Lebel was, in a sense, to create a French-Canadian empire in the North. All he ended up creating was a single region. The history of the train in the north goes hand in hand with that of the church. On the death of Father Lebel, another priest, Father Alphonse Gignier, saw to it that his predecessor's dream came true. He too used perseverance, petitions, and a few votive candles to succeed in bringing the train to Rapide à Lorignal, then finally all the way to Mont Laurier.
The Petit Train du Nord had character. Born of the great determination of its supporters, it was, like them, hard to subdue. The most bullheaded in the whole province of Quebec, it was said. At any moment, the sparks that escaped from the steam engines threatened to set fire to the wooden bridges. But up ahead lay the real challenge. With its numerous bends and steep hills, this route was arduous, even dangerous. These obstacles obliged the engineers to slow down. But wanting to make up for lost time, they tended to push their machines beyond the 48 kilometers an hour allowed by the railway on this tricky route. One day, tragedy would strike. The disaster occurred during the winter of 1947 near Sage Lake. The Petit Train du Nord was jam-packed that day. 300 people were on board. It is whispered that the engineer, doing the route for the first time, had decided to mark the occasion with a glass of whiskey. Thus emboldened, he pushed his engine full tilt. So great was the speed that the passengers began to worry. When they reached the big bend just before Sage Lake, the engineer tried to brake, but it was too late. He could not keep the locomotive on the track. It derailed, dragging three cars with it. The train was buried in snow. The engineer lost his life in the accident. It was a Saturday train heading up to Mont Laurier. The engineer was a guy named Barbeau. He was ranked, but he didn't have a lot of experience. At mile 119, when you get to the upper hills, you start to go down. Then you go up all the way to Bedard. It's all uphill. Then once you get to Bedard, you go straight down to Mont-Laurier. So at this bend, the one at mile 119, he took it at around 20 miles an hour. At 30 miles an hour, he wouldn't have jumped off. It flipped over. As in the rest of Canada, life in the Laurentians followed the rhythm of the railways. The train station had become a focal point of village life. People gathered there, just as they had once gathered in the church square. And just as today kids hang out on the subway, the train station was the place to give youth its fling. Some people thought that the train station was a bad place. You could go there to watch the trains come in. You could meet girls there if you were a boy, and if you were a girl, you could meet boys. So when a station was built, often the priest intervened, sometimes to ask that the station be built outside the municipality or right in the middle of town, depending on their way of thinking. At the stations in St. Jerome and St. Agathe, the train's arrival was an event not to be missed. That was particularly true on Saturday mornings. The farmers waited for the 10 past 10 a.m. train to see the rich city folks get off. The Laurentians had become a chic destination for Montrealers wanting a breath of fresh mountain air on the weekend. It was the first glimmer of an industry which would become the pride of the region. It was the beginning of the tourist industry in the Upper Laurentians. Already in the 1870s, saint Agathe was like a little capital city. The first hotel, the Castel des Monts, was built. There were all kinds of activities. A number of millionaires settled around the Lac des Sables. That was when it really got started. And when skiing arrived on the scene, it became maybe not an El Dorado, but it was really important for the economy of the north. It became the main stay of the parishes in the Upper Laurentians. One bright February morning, Herman Smith Johansson, speeding along on two strange planks of wood called skis, stopped to let the Petit Train du Nord pass by. As he watched the train disappear into the snow-covered mountains, he realized that their destinies had just crossed. It was Herman Johansson, the ski aficionado known as Jack Rabbit, who would introduce the train to a new vocation, tourism. Mont 
Blanc, Saint Sauveur, Mont Tremblant. Every winter, more than 350 centimeters of snow blanket the Laurentian Mountains to the delight of winter sports enthusiasts. Father LaBelle had wanted the North to become a land of farmers. The train would make it a paradise for skiers. Early in the morning on March 9, 1975, a train unlike any other ever seen in the Upper Laurentians arrived in Val David. It was the Jack Rabbit Special. The train had seven gleaming two-story aluminum-covered cars. On board were a thousand merry skiers. All these sports lovers had come here to pay tribute to a celebrity, Jack Rabbit. The trip had been specially organized to celebrate Johansson's 100th birthday and honor his extraordinary influence on the development of tourism and the downhill ski industry in the Laurentians. We, we took the train from Montreal and, and, and got off the train at Val David and everybody piled out, and uh, the daddy gave some kind of a, a speech from La Sapiniere. And uh, then he said, oh, that's enough of talking, let's get going. It was in 1928 that Herman Smith Johansson, then a young engineer specialized in railway facilities, settled in Montreal. He owned a house in Shawbridge in the Laurentians and fell in love with the region's rugged terrain. Whenever he was not working, he was skiing and attracting attention with his crazy long sticks. He visited all the villages established by Father LaBelle. He was known to the lumberjacks who gradually abandoned their snowshoes in favor of skis. He befriended the native people to whom he was known as Jack Rabbit, a nickname that would stick with him his entire life. was pretty agile and he could uh, jump around like a rabbit you see in the trees and that's why they called him Jack Rabbit. In the early days of the 20th century skiing was still the sport of a select few in Quebec. In 1905 members of the Montreal Ski Club accustomed to the slopes of Mount Royal discovered the Laurentians. They climbed aboard the Petit Train du Nord and headed for saint agathe Wearing crude skis that were little more than two planks of wood attached to their boots, these daredevils hurtled down through the woods all the way to Shawbridge. From there, they caught the train back to Montreal. Indeed, it was the Montreal Ski Club that would persuade the railways to put trains on the line specially aimed at skiers. What skiing did was this. It was extremely important on an economic level because it doubled the length of the tourist season. Before that, the north could only be exploited in summertime, and you know how short the summers are in that area. But skiing made it possible to build big hotels, Mont Tremblant Lodge, Chanticleer, Estorelle, etc. It was much more profitable because they could be operated almost year-round, and that was because of skiing. Under the influence of Jack Rabbit, the sport quickly gained in popularity and was soon the bread and butter industry of the Laurentians. And it was skiing that would give the Petit Train du Nord its glory days. In 1932, Johansson cut and marked the famous Maple Leaf Trail, which followed the route of the Petit Train du Nord from Shawbridge to saint agathe to mont tremblant these 144 kilometers of snow and bush would test the mettle of many skiers to the great delight of hotel operators. Well, that's how, how he got the government interested in supporting the idea because it helped the tourist business for the hotels. In 1928, Canadian Pacific added a train to its schedule, the Snow Train, specially reserved for skiers. It was an immediate hit. 
Between December and April, more than 10,000 happy skiers climbed aboard the 229 trains made available to them. And what a sight they made. It was great. Lots of singing, lots of accordions going, and my brother made, a lot of, made up a lot of songs, and for a while I played the accordion, and we, we would lead sing songs in the cars. Everybody was happy. It was a, it was a fun time. By 1939, there were more than 1,600 kilometers of ski trails winding through the upper Laurentians. The farmers began to lose patience with the crowds of people crossing their fields without restriction. That was when Johansson stepped in. He negotiated with the farmers, asked for rights of passage, and delimited the ski trails without asking for a cent in payment. This seemed to be the, the, uh, the feeling in Norway that um, if you took money for skiing, it, uh, it wasn't right, it wasn't sporty. Uh, it was, <laughs> and, and he, that's why he never really made very much money out of skiing. He, he enjoyed what he was doing, but it wasn't a big money maker. And so he never taught. He never gave lessons or anything like that, because that was, well, I shouldn't say beneath his dignity, but it was not what he felt skiing should be. It, should be an amateur sport for the love of it. Around 1932, the two disciplines, cross-country skiing and downhill skiing, were increasingly differentiated one from the other. Downhill skiing became an Olympic sport, and what a sport it was. With minimal equipment, the ski freaks had to brave a two-hour climb up the mountain before dashing down the slopes at breakneck speed. It was mostly a man's game. That same year, an odd contraption made its appearance. It was dubbed Foster's Invention after its inventor, Montrealer Alex Foster. The ancestor of our modern day ski lifts, it was driven by a Chrysler car engine. The system was installed in Shawbridge under Johansson's recommendations. Despite the five cent price for a ticket, the invention was a great success. With the advent of mechanical lifts, the Laurentians had found their definitive vocation and were on their way to prosperity. The villages of the North wasted no time becoming ski literate. In 1939, Mont Tremblant had a ski lift permanently installed. In Shawbridge, saint Sauveur, and Val David, hotels and guest houses raked in money. saint Agathe became a hub of activity, attracting thousands of tourists. It was madness. Canadian Pacific had to run up to 30 snow trains per weekend. They were packed with well-to-do city folk who came to the land of Father Lobel to have a good time and support the local economy. The face of the Laurentians had changed. The colonists were gradually replaced by people from the city. All but the most northerly farmlands were taken over for other uses. The villages that had grown up around the sawmills were transformed one by one. The area became the Americans' little Switzerland. Today's popular tourist resorts, Val David, Chanticleer, Estorel, and Grey Rocks were all built in the 1930s. The train was soon a victim of its own success. The tourist season now lasted the entire year. It was simply too much for the Petit Train du Nord. Roads were needed, highways, routes built especially for the worst enemy of the train, the car. On November 15th, 1981, the whistle of the Petit Train de Nord echoed as usual through the Laurentian Mountains, announcing the train's arrival. But this was no ordinary day for the Petit Train de Nord. This was its last passenger trip. Via Rail, which had inherited passenger service from CP, had decided that maintaining service on this line was unprofitable. When they canceled the regular train, I was torn apart. It was where I belonged. I loved it. It was cars that had finally snuffed out the regional rail line. 
Every weekend, traffic was bumper to bumper on the highways leading from Montreal to the north. Already in the 1940s, cars clogged the difficult Highway 11, which for many years was gravel all the way to St. Agathe. By 1957, travelers were deserting the Petit Train du Nord. Already crippled by bus services and newly paved roads, it would be finished off by the construction of Highway 15. The development of Highway 117, the old Highway 11, and the expressway would actually cause a shift in the villages, the location of the town centers. And what would develop then was what we called nomadic tourism, in other words, one-day drive-by tourism, along with the appearance of motels, hotels, where you stay for only one day in most cases, then carry on the next day. So there was a shift in the development of these small towns, which once centered around the train station, the hotel, and the village square. And that had a considerable impact in terms of urban planning, economic development, culture, and land use. In 1977, when skiing became more popular again, Jack Rabbit, then all of 102 years old, tried to bring the Petit Train du Nord back to life. He succeeded, and the famous train rose from its ashes, but only for a while. Although a Montreal saint Agath round trip ticket cost as little as $6, the Petit Train du Nord remained in service only four years. Despite Johansson's efforts, the famous train went into retirement in 1981. This time, it was for good. Herman Smith Johansson outlived the train by a few years, dying in 1987 at the ripe old age of 112. The North had lost another of its legends. The Petit Train du Nord, so dear to Father LaBelle, would gradually vanish. Piece by piece, the tracks were removed. Today, all that remains is this strip of gravel, like a scar in the wooded landscape. The train employees have left the region. The hangars and barracks are deserted. Years ago, when I worked on the freight trains, I slept here. This was our bunk room. There was another one over there. This was the bedroom. There were four double beds here. Over there was the stove, the fridge. The bathrooms were down there. It was like that for years. The train stations themselves, symbols of the great train era, are empty and deserted. Some, like the station in Shawbridge, now called Prevo, are derelict and have been vandalized. Others survived and were restored as restaurants or country inns. Amazingly enough, it was the bicycle that would breathe new life into Father LaBelle's railway. In 1996, bowing to public pressure, municipal authorities created the Petit Train du Nord Linear Park, one of the longest green corridors in North America. It offers over 200 kilometers of trails along the original right-of-way of Father LaBelle's railway. It is popular with cyclists in summer, cross-country skiers and snowmobilers in winter. Just as Father LaBelle did so many years ago, sports enthusiasts can make their way through the mountains as far as Mont Laurier, admiring the splendid landscapes of the Laurentians. The story of the Petit Train du Nord is far from unique. All across Canada, particularly in rural areas, the train was ousted by the growing popularity of cars and modern means of communication. Over a century ago, railway fever struck the whole country, from the big cities to the rural areas and woodlands. Today, a village, a township, a boulevard, parks, and public buildings all bear the name of Father LaBelle. They remind us of this man's contribution to the development of the Laurentians. True, this northern region does not look quite like the north he'd imagined, but his efforts were not in vain. To future generations, he bequeathed an internationally renowned tourist region in a land of great beauty, blessed by the hand of this larger-than-life priest. <laughs>